Hello. Hello. Dr. Wallinger, Robert. My name is Monica Zgiva. I am an expert in mindfulness and uh, personal development. And I am delighted to be here with you today to talk about a really important issue here, which is happiness. Well, I'm very glad to be here too. Thank you for having me. Robert, could you tell us a little bit more about this study that you have started in, at Harvard many decades ago? It's the longest study on human behavior and happiness. Can you explain to us a little bit more about it? Yes. I am actually the fourth director of the study. Um, it was started in 1938, and it began as two separate research studies, and the studies were not aware of each other. Both started at Harvard. One study was a study of Harvard College undergraduate students, 19-year-old young men who were chosen by their professors as fine upstanding examples of manhood. And it was meant to be a study of uh, how people progress from adolescence into young adulthood. It was meant to be a study of normal young adult development. Um, now we smile at this because if you want to study normal young adult development, you don't just restrict yourself to white males from Harvard University, but at that time, that's what they did. And it was meant to be a study of thriving. At the same time, at Harvard Law School, a law professor, Sheldon Gluck, and his spouse, a social worker named Eleanor Gluck, were interested in juvenile delinquency. They were interested in particularly how some children born into very difficult circumstances, very troubled families, how those children managed to stay out of trouble, managed to stay on good developmental paths. So again, it was a study of thriving, but it was a study of very disadvantaged young people. In a, and then my predecessor, George Valiant, put these two studies together. So we had one very disadvantaged group, one very privileged group. But what was unusual about the studies at the time was that they were not studies of what goes wrong. Most research is on illness, right? And, and problems in human development so that we can help people who have those problems. This was a study of what predicts who's going to thrive in life. And then eventually we brought in all these young men's partners, their spouses, and now we've brought in their children. So we have more than half women in the study and over 2,000 people, 724 families all together. And we're now in our 85th year. It's the longest study of the same families that's ever been done in the history of science. What we found when we were looking at the predictors of what helps people live longer, healthier lives and happier lives, we found something that surprised us, which is that good, warm connections with other people actually make us happier. Yes, that's not a surprise, but they also keep us healthier. And by contrast, people who are lonely, people who are more socially isolated, develop the diseases of aging earlier, and they live shorter lives than people who are not lonely and who have good social connections. In the beginning, we didn't believe our own data. We thought, how could this be? Like, it, it makes sense that we would be happier if we have warmer relationships, but how could warmer relationships predict that we would be less likely to develop coronary artery disease or arthritis or type two diabetes? How could that be possible? And then many other studies began to find the same thing. And that's important because no single study can itself prove a finding like this, that we need many studies to point at the same thing and then we can have confidence that this is a scientific truth. 
And now it's a very well-established finding that good relationships actually promote physical health and longevity. So then how does that work? We've been spending the last 10 years in our laboratory trying to understand how that works. And the best hypothesis we have is that relationships protect us from chronic stress. We know that life is always bringing stressful events, right? I mean, you know, we're having a nice conversation now, but an hour from now, something stressful may happen to me and I'll be upset and my body will change. My body goes into what we call fight or flight mode, um, where the heart rate increases, I might start to sweat, I might start to breathe more quickly. And what we know is that then circulating stress hormones increase, um, inflammation increases. That's all normal. It's good for the body to be able to do that, to, to deal with stress. But then the body is meant to return to equilibrium when the stressor is removed. And you've probably had the experience that when something upsetting happens, but you can go home and talk to a friend, or if I can go home and complain to my wife, I can literally feel my body calm down. And that's what's supposed to happen. We believe that what happens with lonely people, with isolated people, is that they never quite return to their equilibrium, to their baseline. That instead, they're in a kind of low level fight or flight mode much of the time. So they have higher levels of stress hormones, higher levels of chronic inflammation, and those things break down body systems over time. So that's how relationships could affect our coronary arteries and they could affect our joints, for example. Um, and so it's a, it's a way that relationships help us regulate negative emotions. Some people are introverts, some people are extroverts. Can you give us some tools for people to strengthen their relationships regardless of their personality? It's very important for us to talk about this because we're all on a spectrum from being very shy, very introverted to being extroverted. And being shy is perfectly normal and just fine. Uh, in our culture, particularly I know in the United States, we uh, prioritize extroversion. We think extroversion is great, you know? Uh, but actually there's nothing special about being extroverted and, and there are many good things about being shy. What we know is that introverts need fewer people in their lives to feel content, to feel happy, that they get their energy, they, they get refreshed from being alone, from having a lot of alone time. Extroverts get their energy from other people. So they need more people in their lives, but neither one is normal or abnormal. So what we believe is that whether you're introverted or extroverted, everybody needs at least one or two relationships that we call securely attached relationships, where people feel like there's someone there who they can trust to call on, to, to be there for them. When, for, um, in our study with our participants, we asked them at one point, who could you call in the middle of the night if you were sick or scared? And list all the people you could call. And most of our participants had several people they could list, but some of our participants couldn't list anyone. And a few of those participants were married and they didn't list anyone that they could call in the middle of the night. We believe that everybody, whether you're shy or a real party animal, that everybody needs one or two relationships that are secure, safe relationships like that. And then, The rest depends on you, your personality, your temperament, what you need. So shy people may simply want to cultivate and pay close attention to a few people. 
and maintaining those relationships. People who are more extroverted may want to join more clubs, may want to be in situations where there are more people around. So for example, I mean, I don't like loud, noisy clubs with very loud music and lots of dancing, but my younger son loves those clubs and he goes to those clubs all the time. In fact, he loves being in Madrid. He loves visiting Madrid because there are lots of those clubs in Madrid. And so we're very different temperamentally and that's, that's fine. Uh, that's one of the things that makes life interesting and makes our relationships interesting. Could you give us some tips that everybody could use that could be practical for everybody that is watching us today? Yes. One of the things that we found in our research was that the people who were most active in maintaining relationships were the happiest and they had the best relationships. So, for example, when I was in my 20s, I thought I don't have to do anything to promote friendships. My friends are my friends. They'll always be my friends. I don't have to be active. And yet what we saw was that many people uh, would have good relationships that would wither away, that would disappear, not because there was any problem in the relationship, but because they weren't active. So what we noticed was that the people who maintained good relationships would take small actions very often. Small actions like reaching out to a friend. So sending a text to a friend saying, I just wanted to say hello, or calling a friend on the telephone, sending an email, um, particularly making a time to take a walk or to have coffee or um, to go to a, a football game together, anything, but just to make plans regularly with the people who you want to have in your life on a regular basis. The other thing that's very helpful is to establish routines with just a few people. So for example, I wrote the book, The Good Life with my co-author, Mark Schultz. Mark and I have been collaborators for over 25 years, but we've also been friends. So every Friday at noon, we have a telephone call. And we talk about our research and we do writing together. Uh, we wrote chapters of the book while on the telephone with each other. But at the same time, we talk about our families, we talk about our lives, we talk about our health, all of that. And so we stay current with each other's lives. Having that weekly phone call is very important. It means that one of us has to cancel if we're not going to have that phone call. And that means we talk to each other every week, no matter what. Having small routines like that, perhaps it, it's with one of your siblings, perhaps it's with one of your children, perhaps it's with your spouse. The other thing we find is that in relationships that can be taken for granted, that can get stale, like a relationship with a spouse, with a partner, it's very helpful to have regular time just to do nothing but enjoy each other. So a, an example, when we had young children, uh, we got advice from a friend who said, you should have a regular night when you go out on a date, just you two. Hire a babysitter, have the babysitter come regularly. So every Thursday night, the babysitter would arrive at 6 p.m. And we had to cancel the babysitter if we weren't going to go out. So we always went, even if we just went to the mall to buy diapers, uh, even we would go out to dinner. Sometimes we would go see a film, but we would do something and it would be a chance to, to talk to each other, to catch up on our lives. Because when you're raising small children, often it's a time when you are, you are just a, a tag team where all you do is, you know, you make dinner and I'll give them the baths and you know, you don't have time to catch up on how, how we are together as a couple. So that's another example of setting regular times to do something with the people you most care about. The other thing we know is that um, doing activities with other people is a good way to cultivate new relationships. So let's say I'm someone who wishes that I had more friends. 
and I feel more alone than I, than I wish I felt. That research tells us that one of the easiest way to make, ways to make new relationships is to do an activity that we care about, something we love or enjoy or something we're passionate about, but to do it alongside other people. So we see the same people regularly over and over again. So it might be that we volunteer for a cause like a, a food pantry, or we volunteer for political action to work against climate change, or we join a gardening club, or we join a football club. Um, could be anything that we enjoy. And as long as we're doing it alongside other people, it means that we have a natural subject for conversation because we're both doing something we enjoy. And that turns out to be one of the easiest ways to make new relationships. Um, the other thing that often helps for lonely people is to be of service to someone else. So volunteering your time, volunteering your energy is a very good way to, first of all, to feel useful um, and to also feel like people value you. Again, it could be tutoring a child who's having difficulty with reading. It could be uh, teaching people your language, the language that you know so well, but that someone else is trying to learn. So again, being of service is a way to make us feel useful and also to make us feel needed by other people. And that's a good way to combat loneliness. Another tip that I would have is to talk to people who you don't know, talk to strangers. Um, what we find is that people often make new relationships just by striking up a conversation in a coffee shop or at the gym. Um, there was a study of uh, people taking rides on a commuter train in the city of Chicago and they had two groups of people and they assigned one group of people who were going to take the train to work to just do what they normally did. You know, so it might be listening to music, it might be looking at the news on your phone, could be anything, reading. And then they, they assigned the other group to talk to a stranger when they took the ride on the train. And they asked people, how much do you think you're going to enjoy this when you take this train ride? And the people who were going to talk to a stranger thought that they were not going to enjoy it. Afterwards, they asked everybody, how much did you enjoy this train ride? And the people who talked to a stranger were much happier than the people who just did what they normally did on the train. And so what it shows us is that we're not so good at predicting what's going to make us happy and that talking to strangers, striking up conversations with new people, even though it can feel a little scary to take that risk, it usually makes us happy and makes us happier than we were when we just kept to ourselves. You started the research long, a long time ago, and I would like to know if the goals that those people, our great-grandparents, grandparents, those people started, you started um, doing the research when they were, they had gone through World War II and the post-war period. Do their goals differ from the goals that people have now? It's such an interesting question. It's not exactly possible to compare our goals now, but I do know that the people in that generation, the World War II generation, you know, they grew up They were children during the Great Depression, and then many of them went to the war. And so terrible traumas um, that they experienced. Um, many of them were much more concerned about providing well for their families, right? Because they had known poverty. They had known that, uh, that your economic security could disappear in a moment or that your, your safety in the world could disappear in a moment if someone declares war on your country, right? Um, so many of them were more concerned with living a good life, with living a life that had meaning and purpose, 
and they were concerned about being able to provide well for their families. And that's still the case. Those goals are still there for many people today. Uh, but people talk more about self-actualization. They talk more about developing them, their full potential as individuals. Now there's much more emphasis, at least in Western culture, on the individual. And I think in, in the earlier generation, particularly the World War II generation, there was more emphasis on society and on social well-being uh, and social good. I think now young people, millennials and particularly Gen Z, are, being, are more concerned again with collective well-being, particularly because of climate change. My sons say to me, your generation has messed everything up. You know, you've ruined the climate. And they, they're very concerned with the health of the planet and the health of societies in a way that I think my generation, the baby boomer generation, has not been. What about um, when you have asked young people and what, what were their goals now? I think those goals are very different from what you're saying now. Yeah. Well, there was a survey, the first survey in 2007 of many thousands of uh, millennials, people in their 20s. And the, the question was, what are your major life goals? And in that survey, over 80% said that they wanted to become wealthy, not just, you know, have economic security, but be wealthy. And over half of them said they wanted to become famous, which is incredible. I mean, that's such a different aspiration. Um, who wants, I mean, being famous is a strange goal. And then another group said that they wanted to achieve a lot at work. Um, and then they went back to these same people in 2017, so 10 years later, and asked the same question. And still, fewer wanted to become famous, but just as many wanted wealth and wanted to achieve a great deal at work. So those same goals were there, even though in the World Happiness Report that the UN publishes every year, um, those are not some of the most commonly expressed goals that people have for having a good life. You know, the most commonly expressed goals around the world are more about social support, about access to good health care, about freedom to make major life choices. Those, those are the things that people say they need to have a good life, not wealth and fame. <laughs> Um, so you're right, the, these were uh, goals that surprised many of us when reading about them. My hope is that that's changing again as these world problems are becoming more evident and the need for more communal effort to solve our biggest problems. Going back to our current time or continuing with that now, it seems that there is a growing problem in our society and it has to do with the digital world and social media. It seems that instead of bringing us together, it's pushing us apart. What can you tell us about it? It's a great concern. And now they're doing a lot of research on this, on how interaction in the digital world is affecting us as humans. And we do know some, there's much more research that we need to do, but the early research suggests that how we interact with digital media makes a big difference in whether our will, well-being increases or decreases. So what they find is that when we actively use social media to connect with other people, we get happier, our sense of well-being increases. I'll give you an example. Um, one of my friends, during the pandemic, during the lockdown, um, he reconnected with his friends from grade school, from primary school, from when he was eight years old. And he and his friends have started having coffee every Sunday morning on Zoom. And they have, now they have coffee and they talk about their childhoods and they have such a good time. And what he finds is that using social media, in this case, Facebook, makes him happier. 
But we also find that when we consume social media passively, so when we look at other people's Facebook or Instagram feeds, um, that we get less happy. Because what happens is that, that we're all editing our lives. We're all curating our lives on social media. So, you know, I don't post the pictures when I wake up in the morning unhappy or depressed or thinking that my life is meaningless, right? I don't post those pictures, right? I only post the pictures when I'm on a, you know, on a beautiful beach or when I'm in Madrid, you know, having a nice time, right? Um, and the problem with that is that even though most of us know that these lives are not the whole truth, it's still possible to get the feeling that everybody else is having a good life and everybody else has figured life out except me. And one of my teachers once used an expression that I find very helpful. He said, we are always comparing our insides to other people's outsides. We're always comparing the sort of changeability and messiness of how I feel with what other people look like, right? Um, and so when we passively consume somebody else's Instagram feeds, it makes us compare ourselves negatively to other people. And so our self-esteem gets lower, we get more depressed, we get more anxious. But if we can be more active, both in how we use social media and when we separate ourselves from the digital world, when we turn off our screens, that when we do both of those, we are likely to enhance our well-being. So what would you recommend people, what people can do in these situations when you start looking at the feed and yeah. you go there for five minutes, you are queuing, you are on a line waiting for something. And it's like, okay, I'm just going to have a look at Instagram. And then you stay there for half an hour, two hours. Yeah, yeah. What would you recommend people to do? Well, two things. One is look at your different activities online. So spend 10 minutes, 15 minutes doing something you normally do online. Maybe it's looking at a particular social media website. And then notice, does it make you feel more energetic? Does it make you feel more optimistic? Or does it make you feel more self-conscious or more depressed or more left out? And if it makes you feel more left out, more down, turn away from that activity, turn away from that platform and turn toward the platforms, turn toward the activities online that make you feel more energetic. Similarly, You know, if we think about the, the voices that we listen to, the influencers, the, the politicians, the celebrities, think about, you know, take notice of the people who make you feel more hopeful about life, more open to the world, more open to other people, and then notice the people who make you feel more angry, more afraid, more closed off, and turn away from those people who make you feel more closed off from the world that it's possible to, to really be more active in choosing where we direct our attention. The difficulty is that the software is designed to grab our attention and hold it and not let us go because people make more money when they hold Sorry. our attention, <laughs> right? So the path of least resistance is to stay hooked on a particular piece of software, on a particular platform. And so we need to be more active and more intentional in directing our attention. And that's the, the strongest recommendation I would give to people, to pay very close attention to that and to where you want to devote your very precious attention. So be more mindful about what you are doing and how you're feeling while you are doing it. Exactly. Another current problem that we have in our society is the loneliness that people feel when they retire or the loneliness of older people, how could this be alleviated? Hmm. It's very difficult for older people because many older people face losses. You know, we, we lose partners, we lose friends. One of the biggest complaints I hear from older people is everyone is dying. All my friends are dying, my family's dying. 
And, and loss is, of course, a natural part of getting older. And so what we need to do is try to be more active in bringing in new friends, in making new friends, new relationships, including, if we can, relationships with younger people. So they have programs now, at least in the U.S., where they have, they, they have partnerships, they have a buddy system, we call it, between an older person and a preschool child a four-year-old, and the older person reads to the four-year-old, and everybody loves it. The, the children love it, and the older people love it. And so that's one way that older people can become connected with people in different ages. Similarly, older people can mentor younger people, younger workers, for example. Like many younger workers are hungry for mentorship and wanna know what, how did you make it through this difficult time? Or, or how did you do this job? And how did you balance your personal life with your work life? There's so many things that older people have learned um, that younger people want to know. And so there are programs where, where older people can volunteer to mentor younger people. Similarly, we can reach out to older people, particularly older people who who can't leave their homes. Some older people are physically unable to get out. And so it's harder for them to connect with other people. And for those people, there are programs where they can be connected either digitally, virtually with other people, but also there can be home visits where people come and, and spend time with older adults. All of this uh, involves ways to alleviate loneliness. Um, one of the things that's uh, of concern in more traditional societies is that those traditional family structures are breaking down, those, those structures where older people have definite roles. So for example, in China, it's absolutely the norm for grandparents to raise their grandchildren while the middle group, the children, go off to work. And now with younger people in China leaving their villages and going to the big cities because there's economic opportunity, the older people lose their role raising children and the children then don't have anyone to help raise the grandchildren. So the breakdown of these kind of traditional social patterns has become a source of grave concern and it increases loneliness among older adults. Um, the same is occurring, for example, in India, and there's a lot of concern about this there. And nowadays, there is a lot of talk about toxic relationships. I would like to focus more on what, it, what does it make a good relationship, a healthy and satisfying relationship? Can you tell us more about it? Well, we know that we get many different kinds of things from relationships. And, and that's important because it's easy to imagine that we're supposed to get everything from one relationship, for example, a romantic relationship, and that's not true because there's such variety in what relationships give us. So certainly they get, give us a sense of closeness. It's very important to have the feeling that I can confide in someone, that I can tell them my worries, that I can get advice when I'm concerned about something in my life or concerned about someone in my family or concerned about my job. So having a, a safe place and a trusted person to share my concerns with is very useful. Um, but relationships give us so many more things. I have some relationships that are just for fun. Um, we do playful things together. We go see a football match together or we, uh, I have, friends who I ride bicycles with. I, uh, you know, I have friends who, who I go out for food with because we love special foods. And so we go to nice restaurants in Boston. You know, um, so there are many different things that we get in terms of fun, in terms of activities. I have some friends who are my intellectual friends and we, we talk about ideas and we debate. Um, uh, friends often give us a sense of identity of who we are. So the people I'm with often make me feel like I belong, like I belong to a certain community, to a certain group. And that's very important for all of us. All of us need to feel that we belong. Um, 
In addition, there are friends who challenge us. So that I have some friends who will tell me the truth, even when it's not easy for me to hear the truth. And I appreciate that. I and mean, sometimes it hurts a little bit, but so we want friends who will tell us what they really think. Not every friend needs to do that for us, but it's very helpful to have at least one or two people in the world who will tell us the truth and tell us things that no one else will tell us. Um, also, casual relationships are important. So casual friendships turn out to be quite useful. Uh, many times it's not our close relationships that turn out to be of value, but people who we hardly know. So they did a study of people looking for a next job. And what they found was that you're more likely to find your next job through a casual acquaintance than you are to find it through a close friend. And that's because casual acquaintances often belong to very different networks, very different communities than our closest friends. So casual relationships are very good for us. And that includes the person we talk to in the morning in the coffee shop, um, the person who delivers our mail, or the person at the grocery store. Um, so all of this is a way of saying that relationships bring us many different kinds of positive benefits. So we don't talk in the book a lot about toxic relationships uh, because one of the things that we know is that every relationship that's important has difficulty, or at least we have differences with people. There's always some difference or some conflict with somebody who's important, you know, a sibling, a spouse, a good friend. And so having disagreements is normal. And what's important is to figure out ways to work on disagreements, to come through disagreements so that nobody feels like they're the loser or the winner, but that we come, we come away from disagreements feeling like we've both understood each other better. And when we do that, the relationship usually gets stronger. So one of the things that we talk about in the book is the importance of trying to work on relationships and work out difficulties. But when we try to work on difficulties and it's not possible, that's often when we're in a relationship that just makes us feel bad, that sometimes we call it a toxic relationship. And some of those relationships we need to end, we need to step away from, particularly relationships where there's violence, where there's fear, where there's intimidation. Those are relationships where it's very important to, to get to a place of safety, usually by finding refuge and, and stepping away from those toxic relationships. But the important thing is to try to work out difficulties in relationships before we give up on them. Robert, many um, in life, there are many things that lie outside of our control and sometimes those things that happen do affect us. Yeah. And there are many people out there that think that because of their circumstances or their limitations, they cannot do much about their own happiness. Mm. What can you say about this? There's actually some good science about this. There was a study by a psychologist named Sonia Lubomirsky and she wanted to estimate how much of our happiness is under our control. And so she took a lot of data from many different studies. And in her estimation, about 50% of our happiness, of our mood, is genetically influenced. It's inborn temperament. So about 50% is not under our control. And we all know people who are like, always cheerful no matter what, even when terrible things happen. And we know other people who are always gloomy, even when everything is fine, right? And that's just inborn temperament. So Lubomirsky estimates that about half of our happiness is that inborn temperament. And she estimates that about 10% of our happiness is due to our particular life circumstances right now. So if I'm in a very bad situation, 
And then about 40% of our happiness is under our control. We can improve that. And that's important because 40% is it's a large a amount. Yeah. <laughs> and so we can do all kinds of things to build happier lives. Um, but there is this kind of bedrock of mood, of temperament, of personality that we're all born with. Um, we, we sometimes call it a, uh, a happiness set point. It's, it's almost like an inclination, right? Yeah. In your study, you ask participants at the end of their lives, what do they regret the most? Yeah. Can you share that with us today? When our original participants got to be about age 80, we, we said, look back on your life and tell us what do you regret the most? What, what are you proudest of? And what the man regretted most often was spending too much time at work and not spending enough time with the people they cared about. Uh, you know, and it's a cliche, you know, nobody on their deathbed ever wished that they had spent more time at the office, right? And it's a cliche for a reason, because many people feel this way. Many of the women in our study said that they most regretted that they had spent so much time worrying about what other people thought, what other people's opinions of them, other people's opinions about what was right and wrong, and that they wished that they had lived more authentic lives. But when we asked people what they were proudest of, almost everyone mentioned their relationships. So they mentioned, you know, I was a good boss. I was a good parent. I was a good friend. Um, I was a good mentor. Um, almost nobody said, you know, I won the Nobel Prize, or I became a billionaire, or, and we had many famous, rich people, right? Uh, but nobody mentioned those things. They mentioned the quality of their relationships. So I guess when we get to the end of our lives, we get to be closer to what really matters? Yeah, yeah. I would like to ask you a more personal question. What do you do in your life to feel more fulfilled, to feel happier? I am a Zen practitioner, so I meditate and I find that very helpful. It, it does help me feel happier, more grounded. Um, I spend a lot of time with people. Uh, like I've, I've had to learn from my own research how important it is to spend time with people. And so now I really make an effort to connect, to make sure I connect with my close friends, um, I spend time in nature. I find that spending time outdoors, especially if I meditate outdoors, it's really helpful. I mean, spending time just looking at a tree for 10 minutes is a wonderful experience. If you really give your full attention to that tree, um, you see so much. Or watching birds, I mean, it's incredible. Um, so those are some of the things that make me happiest now. Um, and I really like travel. Actually, I've loved coming to Madrid. Um, my wife and I both really enjoy seeing new places, meeting people, that kind of thing. Robert, besides being a psychiatrist, a researcher, a professor, you're also a Zen teacher. According to Zen, where are the things that are conducive to having a good life? According to Zen, the good life is being awake in the present moment. It's paying attention to whatever is here right now in the present. Not worrying about the future, not worrying about the past, just being here and being present for whatever comes up. And that, according to Zen, is nirvana. That is enlightenment. Nothing fancier than that. But it's, it's also very difficult. Yes, it is difficult. So, so what would you give like some advice to people to, to do that more often? Because this is some, something that is very difficult in our society yeah. with, where there is so much distraction and everything is um, fighting for our attention. How yeah. would you do that? Yeah. Well, meditation is not something that everybody should do. So for example, my wife has no interest in meditation. She loves the fact that I'm a meditator and she supports me in doing it. She says that it makes me a much better listener and it makes me a better husband, but she has no interest. But she loves music and she loses herself in playing the piano, 
in singing. And so that is the place where she finds a kind of engagement with the present moment. And what I think everyone should find if they can is something that allows them to be very present in the moment. Sometimes we call it a state of flow um, and that it, it could be skiing down a ski slope. It could be working in a garden. It, it could be any number of things. And it, it's that experience where you're just in the activity and time seems to pass by without your even being aware of it. And that's that state of absorption, we call it, that, um, that many people can find. Some of us find it in meditation, but you don't have to meditate to find it. There are many ways to find it. I am very curious about something, Robert. How open are um, institutions such as Harvard about meditation and spirituality? I know that in the past, for example, um, Daniel Goleman or Richard Davison had to hide that part of themselves, yeah. or Randas had to leave, uh, quit teaching there altogether. Has this changed nowadays in the last few years? It has definitely changed. When I started my Zen practice, I kept it hidden. I was afraid that no one would take me seriously as a scientist if they thought I had this spiritual practice. But what's clear now is, first of all, we realize that spiritual uh, life is a very helpful con contributor to our well-being, right? And so for, for some of us, not for everyone, many people don't feel the need for a spiritual life, but some of us do, many of us do. We also know from good scientific research that spiritual practices help many people. They are good for our physical health, they're good for our mental health. So in that sense, there's also scientific evidence that spiritual practices matter in the world. And I think for that reason, there's less prejudice in the academic world, for example, in Harvard, uh, prejudice against spirituality and religion. Um, and what I know now is that I've learned that when I ask my patients, so I work with patients every day in psychotherapy, when I ask my patients about their spiritual lives, first of all, they're relieved because they don't know if it's okay to talk about that in psychotherapy, and then they open up and they want to talk about it. Um, they want to talk about their beliefs and about how they practice, what they practice. And so what I find is that the more open I am about that, I don't, I don't tell my patients all the details about my spiritual practice, but I'm very clear that I'm a Zen practitioner, and I think for that reason many people feel comfortable talking to me about their religion or their spirituality. Well, Robert, it has been such a pleasure to be here with you and speaking about all these very interesting topics. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's been a really interesting interview. <laughs>